All right, so this hour I will talk about iterative reconstruction and to explain it, I start with some slides to explain the idea of iterative inversion. And so here is that idea. So the, the, the essential thing is that instead of um, mathematical inversion, we go for numerical inversion. So that means we have to think less because we don't have to solve a difficult mathematical problem and we replace that with computation time. So the computer needs to work harder because we don't provide it uh, an, an accurate solution. And here is the idea. <clears throat> we have a measurement um, and we start with a solution or we propose a solution, just an initial uh, value or an image. And then based on that solution, we apply the operation that we want to invert. And the idea is that we have to deal with an inverse problem and it, these kind of problems pops up all the time. It's remarkable, some things are very difficult in one direction and easy in the other direction. And so an inverse problem is something that is difficult in the direction that we want to go. And that's why we go in the other direction. So we describe the operator that we managed to do. And based on that, we can predict what we should have measured if this initial value or uh, initial solution was correct. So we check with the measurement. And of course, the first iteration, they will be very different. And then here comes the trick. We need to update that solution. And the update should be good, but it should definitely not be perfect. If it were perfect, then the thing would not be iterative. So all we need to ensure is that this is better than the first solution. And that is much more doable than doing a mathematical inverse. So then this is improved, and then we repeat the, the, the whole uh, procedure. And so the idea is, of course, if, if we can go with our forward operation from right to left, then that implies that in the other direction is the inverse operation. So if we manage to iterate until this prediction is as good as identical to the measurement, then we go from here to our solution with the inverse operator. Now to show this and also show a few interesting features of such algorithms, I take an example of an inverse problem, which is the square root of A. So for some weird reason, taking a square root is very difficult and squaring is very easy. So we're a bit intimidated by this square root. We don't see a good mathematical solution. So we say we will re reformulate the problem to avoid the square root. So we say find x such that if we square x, we get A. So that does not contain a square root. So now we're gonna make it iterative <clears throat> and we assume we have an initial guess x zero. And then the question is find an update of that x zero such that if we add that update to x zero, that if we square it now that we get a. All right, so this is the problem we should solve. And this delta x is the unknown. Uh, yeah, this x is the same as that x zero. So this is quadratic equation. And of course, as you know, to solve quadratic equations, you need to compute square roots. And the idea was to avoid the square root because we don't know how to compute it. But then we realized that actually this is too strict. We only have to guarantee that if we add delta x to x zero, that the solution gets better. So we should, should get in some way closer to the square root of uh, a, but it, it doesn't have to be exactly right. Okay, so then we say, assume we were lucky with the initial guess and that that guess is not too bad. Then X would be larger than Delta X because we only need a smaller K. And that means that this term is larger than that term and this term is larger than that term. So this one, this Delta X squared is the smallest one. So let's delete it. So now this is not exactly true anymore, but it is, almost true if that delta x was not too large. And the cool thing is now it's not a quadratic equation anymore. So now we can solve. So now the solution is simple. We compute delta x like this. And this is the iterative procedure. So basically we take our current solution x, we apply the forward operator, we square it. We subtract it from a to see if we're good. If that is zero, we're done. And delta x is zero, nothing happens anymore. If this is positive, then that implies that X was a bit small and that's good. So then we go in the right direction and same if, if this is negative. So this is definitely the right direction. And apparently if this reasoning was not too bad, then this two X is a good step size. 
this avoids that we jump too large, too, too far in the good direction, uh, such that that would um, uh, jeopardize convergence. And if we don't jump far enough, then it would take forever. Okay, so let's see how well this thing works. So here is the scheme again. All right, so we have A with, for which we have to take the square root. We will put the solution, our, our solution here. We square it, this is the forward operator. And then we compare the two in this case by computing the difference, dividing by two X and updating that. And so we can check it by take a value that we happen to know the square root of. And we see what happens if we just put a value one here. And you can easily check if you uh, go around a bit that these are the values that you will get if you start from one. And you see that in the beginning, it oscillates a bit wildly, but as soon as you get close to the solution, it converges extremely fast. So and, uh, you, you get lots of figures here. All right. <clears throat> So this works nicely and remarkably, actually, my initial value violated that assumption in the derivation. So that assumption was not even necessary because one is far away from the true solution. And so in that first iteration, the delta x we need is actually larger than x, but it still converges. All right, and yeah, you see that this converges. And of course, we can see that we're doing well because our prediction gets very close to the, the true value. So we can monitor convergence. All right, now we can see what happens if we mess around with this uh, update here, because that's the tricky thing. So we, we, we describe the square root here, but here we need to invent something such that this update is better. So I just divided it arbitrarily by two to see what happens. And you see it still converges, but it converges slower. So we need more iterations, but we still find the square root of 25. So it turns out that there is some robustness in this loop. This just needs to be good enough, but we can be a bit sloppy here. Um, it still converges to the solution. In contrast, if we mess around here with this uh, forward operator, then it converges to something else. So you can say, ah, this is bad news. If, if we have to take the square root, we have to model the square exactly right, otherwise something else happens. So that's bad news. That means if we have to make a reconstruction from a spec image, we have to model what happens during the acquisition exactly right. Otherwise, the algorithm will converge to something else. But you can also say, oh, this is actually very good. Because instead of taking computing the square root, we can compute what we want. Because here, we computed the, 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 the 2.1 root of uh, x or of a. <coughs> and by just changing this value a bit, we, we change the, the, the operator that we invert, and we even didn't have to adjust this, this uh, loop here. But uh, yeah, as you can see, the whole thing can be regarded as a feedback loop. And as you know, uh, a feedback loop is very sensitive to the uh, feedback and much less sensitive to the feed forward. So you can compare it to driving a car. And if you... Uh, press the whatever you call it, so you, you give more fuel. <clears throat> so that, that the response of the car to the pressure of your foot is very different from car to car. But we don't care because that is what is happening here. We look at the speedometer and that speedometer needs to be, needs to be accurate. And that's the feedback loop that the speedometer is sitting here. Okay, so we need to remember this needs to be exactly right. Here we have some freedom. And if you read papers about iterative reconstruction, you will see that there are lots of papers saying, how can I efficiently uh, and, and correctly model what happens during the acquisition? So there's a huge amount of papers there. And then there's a lot of other papers saying, how can I fiddle here to get to my solution fast? All right, <clears throat> so now we're gonna apply that to Iterative reconstruction, and as you know, the most popular algorithm is maximum likelihood, expectation, maximization. So we'll have a look at that. Now, the first thing to do is to discretize everything, because previously I explained these analytical algorithms, and they assume that everything is continuous, that we have infinitely many measurements, infinitely fine sampling detectors, and that the patient has a continuous tracer distribution in the body that we need to reconstruct. And then they do all the mathematics and then at the very end they say, oh, we have to do it with computers, let's discretize our equations. 
Here we go the other way around. We say, no, no, everything is discrete. So instead of modeling the data as um, a continuous function, we model it as a discrete function, which is correct because we have a finite number of detectors and finite number of samples. So this is actually an improvement because it describes the real discrete nature of our network. But for convenience, we also have to discretize the patient, and that's definitely not right. The patient doesn't consist of little blocks of radioactivity. So here, we hope that if we make those voxels small enough, we can get away with it. All right, and now you see um, that PET and SPECT are very similar. Uh, not exactly similar, as you can see, the, the equations are different, and you will recall that for PET, the attenuation is the same along the entire LOR, and for SPECT, it depends on the position. So we have here an integral of the activity along the line, which is uh, integrated over x, and that x is also in this integral because we need, for every point, the attenuation from here all the way to the gamma gamma. For PET, it's much easier, it's the attenuation along the line for all points along that line. But in both cases, this is, if you discretize it, becomes a sum, <coughs> and you can write it like that, and you see that's identical. The, the uh, difference is in the definition of these um, uh, system matrix elements. Okay, so in the, in the following most of the slides, the, the signing ground will be called Y, activity will be called lambda and elements of the system matrix are usually C and if that's not the case then they will be A I think. And we also uh, use a single index although these are images they're typically 2D or 3D but we, we have a finite number of them so we get away with one single index same for the sinogram as up to five dimensions but finite number so we give them all a single index and that means that this thing only has two indices and it tells us what the sensitivity of I, Y is. And a particular Y would be, for example, this line. And then C, I, J tells us, for example, what is the activity of this voxel to measurements along this line. It will be zero. If the voxel is close or on the line, it will be uh, larger than zero. Same here. Here it's different. For CT, the situation is different. And the reason is that here we know the activity, well, actually not an activity, we know the, the radiation source. And the unknown is now the attenuation. And so the relation is different, it's an exponent. So we will, can make one algorithm and solve both of these. We probably need another algorithm for the transmission. Okay, so let's first look at the emission. And here is a simple, uh, example where we can easily demonstrate what we mean with the maximum likelihood. So suppose we have the following problem. Somebody put a point source here. So we have only one unknown, that is the activity in that source. And we have two measurements. Uh, and one measurement produced in one second 107 counts. And the other measurement at the same time produced 93 counts. And we know that the sensitivity of these detectors is one in 10,000. Okay, so for every photon emitted here, for every 10,000 photons emitted here, one will get in here and one will get in here on the average, of course. But there is Poisson noise, so each time we do a measurement, the result will be different. Now the question is, what is the activity in the point source? So, well, you know, we have to multiply this with 10,000 to get an idea, so it's going to be around a million counts emitted per second, so that would be a megabecker. But of course, the same measurement could result from 1.05 megabecquerel, or maybe a bit more, or maybe a bit less. According to statistics, all of these solutions could, could have produced this measurement, which is a bit inconvenient because we cannot produce millions of images and uh, give them to the MDs and say one of these might be the true image. So what to do? All right, <clears throat> we go for the maximum, oh, for the maximum likelihood here. So we can compute how likely it is to measure the measure to obtain the measurement given a particular activity. So we say, okay, let's assume that there was one megabecquerel in that source and we measure for one second, then you would expect on the average to have 100 photons in both detectors. And then we can compute the probability of actually having 107 in one and 93 in the other one. And you can 
they are independent, so you multiply these probabilities and you will get a very small one. And then we can look at all the other solutions, for example, slightly more activity. And then we can compute again the probabilities, and the probability will be a bit better for the 107, but it will be a bit worse for the 92. And if you do the mathematics, you will find that the increase of probability for 107 is more than offset by the lower probability of 93. So the solution is slightly less likely. And if, if you check it, you will find that this, in this case, is the maximum li likelihood solution. So you can say, okay, if it's so likely, what is the likelihood? Well, if you compute it, the value is ridiculously small. The chance that this is actually the true solution is almost zero. And this is a modest problem. So for a patient, we know that the ma maximum likelihood solution is definitely not correct. But all other possible solutions we can think of are even more likely to be incorrect. So we know we give a bad solution. So we can hardly claim we give the maximum likelihood because it has higher likelihood. That's ridiculous. The likelihood is small. So the, the thing is, we hope that by picking this one, we do a good job. And that in most cases, this image is sufficiently similar to the true image for the MDs to be happy. And it gives us a way to decide which of the many solutions to take. All right, so let's do that. <coughs> so actually what we would like to maximize is this. So we are given the data and it would be nice if we could, com could compute for every possible image, how likely it would be that this is the true image given those data. That's what we really want. But if you formulate it like that, you start from the data and you go to the reconstruction, which is in, in this direction, and that is the difficult direction. So we don't like that. We would prefer to go in the other direction because going from data to reconstruction is, is even worse than taking a square root. So we'd very much like to avoid that. So we, we want to go for the other formulation, which is this. Somebody gives the reconstruction and then we can do a good simulation and say, well, if that is the distribution, then you should probably measure something like this. That is the easy for problem, although you could argue that you pet and spec is actually not that easy, but it's definitely easier than this one. So we want a formulation like this, and Bias can help us with that because he says, well, this probability is equal to that. So this is what we want to maximize, the reconstruction given the data. And Bias says, well, this is the same thing. It's the probability of the data given the reconstruction times the probability of the reconstruction and divided by the probability of the data. If you forgot the rule, you can easily uh, find it back. If you put this P data at the other side, it is pretty trivial that the two things are equal and then they become equal to the probability of both the reconstruction and the data corresponding to the truth, to the truth. All right. <coughs> So the first thing we note is that the data are given. There's nothing we can change about it. We only maximize for the reconstruction. So this thing is a constant. So we simply delete it, then it's proportional, but that's good enough. So if we maximize this, we will also maximize that. So, but now we have the problem that we have to compute the probability of an image being, uh, what is the chance that a particular image I show you corresponds to the true tracer distribution in the patient, but you cannot look at the data. So a patient comes and we just show an image to the MD and we say, what is the probability that this is correct? And actually the medical doctor can give you a huge amount of information about that. Like if you show an image with two hearts, it's very unlikely that that is correct. Or if your brain scan is gonna be taken and you show a painting by Picasso, then the, the MD will say, no, no, this is definitely wrong. So there is, a, a very large amount of prior knowledge that in principle we have, but it's very hard to describe it mathematically. So now we have a difficulty here and we choose to ignore it. We say, well, this is really difficult. Let's simply assume that the a priori probability of all images is the same. Definitely not true, but very convenient because if we do it like that, we get what we want instead of the difficult problem we can go for the easier problem. So that's actually the only justification. And later we'll actually regret we deleted it and we will undelete it as I will explain later. So, but for now we do away with it 
And then we call it maximum likelihood because this is the likelihood. All right, <clears throat> so now what did we achieve? We will start, somebody gives us a reconstruction, we compute the probability of that reconstruction and then we recommend improve. So here is a reconstruction. And again, yeah, I predicted that I would call it lambda, but sometimes it's called X. So X here is the activity and uh, J is just all the pixels one after the other. We compute the projection. So again, we compute this where we say the expectation, given this image, the expectation of the measured sinogram is this yi here, summing over x, and in this case, adding a contribution of scatter or randoms, uh, things like that. All right, so now we have this, and uh, this is our prediction, and this is the sinogram. And the assumption is that if we do everything correctly, then the only reason that the two are different is that there is noise, because everything else we modeled correctly. Everything else is in this CIJ and SI. So the geometry of the system is here, the detector sensitivity is here, attenuation is there, and scatter for convenience we don't put here, but here. Okay, so now we have to compute the probability that this difference is due to noise. And we can compute that. And fortunately, these probabilities are different in every independent in every box. So the Poisson noise in the data is uncorrelated. A pixel here doesn't ask his neighbor, are you a bit higher than you should be or lower? And then decide to respond to that. They don't talk to one another. They independently decide what to do. That means that we can multiply all these probabilities. So we can just compute the probability for one particular pixel, say, what is the likelihood it deviates so many photons from what we expect? And we do that for all of them and multiply it. So as you can expect, because typically we have millions of values here, that this value is essentially going to be zero. But we can model it because this probability is Poisson noise, and we know the Poisson noise expression. So we can compute all these probabilities and multiply. So again, this is the same thing, small resume here. So we have applied this rule of bias. <coughs> now lambda is the reconstruction, y is the data. And we have rewritten this like that because this term is the one we're interested in. We delete this one because it's constant. We delete this one because we don't like it. And then we get the maximum likelihood problem, which is this. Now um, we use Poisson noise. So the probability of one particular measurement given the entire the reconstructed image can be computed like this. So this is the Poisson probability of getting yi photons if you expect y hat i photons and y hat is written here. So we take our image for our projected at the scatter. Say this is what we expect. Insert it in the Poisson expression to see how likely it is that in this case we get the measurement. So that's for one pixel for the sinogram. We multiply it. Now, this looks pretty messy with that exponent and all these multiplications. It's also going to be ridiculously small, so it's convenient to take the logarithm of that. Then that product becomes a certain summation. The exponent is gone. We have a logarithm here, which is a bit inconvenient. All right, so yeah, you can easily check that these two uh, correspond. And then we know that this thing is a term just dependent on the data. And the data are given, it's a constant. We're going to maximize this over the image, and the image is here. It's sitting in y hat. So this term and this term depend on the reconstruction. This one doesn't. So it's just a constant offset. It shifts the, the graph, but it doesn't shift the maximum. So oh, we delete that one too, and then we get here. So very often in the paper, you will say, they will say, this is the likelihood. Actually, it is the logarithm of the likelihood after deleting the constant terms. <clears throat> 